But simply put, project management when practiced artfully can be like Aikido. And the important thing about this is it's a very subtle technique. It's best to use and applied when no one knows you're doing it. So if people know you're doing it, you're really not doing it correctly. So I'll show you some examples here. So first of all, the essence of PM Aikido, as I call it, I needed to see succeed. You just helped me, but you didn't realize it. I made you do something you didn't necessarily think you were going to do, and I got the help I needed. So here are some five examples that are real life examples that worked for me over the years. Um, some of them are funny. I think uh, one of them is I laugh every time I see it. Uh, I love telling it because it's just it's too almost hard to believe. Uh, one is very embarrassing, and uh, they're all I think provo provocative, and they kind of read like a Jeopardy uh, category list here. Be correct on purpose, shoot me in the head please, be transparent, take the hit, you're in my critical path, let the data speak. So I'll go into these here and uh, uh, hope you enjoy them. This is my favorite one, be correct on purpose. Um, this I think was the most creative one I've come up with, very effective and um, I just, like I say, I chuckle every time I, 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 I talk about it. I was working, I don't know if you can read this or not, this is a snippet of an email I sent out. It's dated February 11th, 4.37 p.m. And I was working with a vendor who was terrible at answering emails. They would not answer emails I was asking uh, questions about. I don't know if you can read this or not, but I'm asking for a version number of some software we were using we were gonna test and go live with. And uh, uh, just was not getting answers to them. So I, I put this email together and what no one knows is I made that up. It has no substance in reality at all. So what I wrote here, it, I just pulled it out of the air. So I remember 4.37 p.m., 10 minutes later, I get a reply with the information I need. All the version numbers going for you, I don't know if you can read that very well or not, but tell me every exact thing I needed going forward. It was what I needed three weeks before if I had only applied that technique earlier or had somebody was cooperating. So the essence of PM Aikido in this case, you wouldn't give me the information I needed, so I tricked you. <laughs> By saying I was going to use bad information, and immediately you gave me what I needed. Now what's funny about this is, this, the subtle part of this is that no one ever asked me, they said, Charles, where did you come up with those version numbers? No one ever asked that. They just gave me the information and went on like nothing else was, any, nothing was wrong. I thought that was so funny that, you know, I just tricked them like that. And it worked. So example two, I think most people will relate to this one. Uh, imagine you're a project manager and you need to have someone on your team write up some documentation on some new process. And you say, say you're working with Sally. You might say, Sally, I need you to document this process for me. We need to have this so we can turn it over operational support uh, at the project end. And, uh, Sally's eyes start to roll back in her head and she starts humming and hawing and she doesn't actually say this but here's what she's thinking. Uh, you're kidding, please just go ahead and shoot me in the head and get it over with. Put me out of my misery please because I really don't like to write. So here's what my provocative technique is. is, is start As a project manager in my role, I would write draft versions of the documentation just to sort of prime the pump. Uh, it may not even be all correct but it got something out there, it got the discussion going, and it helped move the, move the ball onto the finish line. And why is it that it works is the people gladly will tell you what's wrong. They can't write anything, but they will tell you what's wrong with stuff. It's an amazing phenomenon to have, and Dick and I have talked about this a number of times. I'm sure it happens all over the world. There are people who cannot write, but they will tell you everything that's wrong with what you wrote. So the Aikido principle here is I needed the documentation done, coax it out of you, and got it to the fast track. So why again does this work? People love to help. People don't necessarily want to write things, but people always will want to go to your aid if you ask for help. Um, the other thing is, is people appreciate this, strangely enough, and the really secret point is here, it really makes you look good, because you wrote that. You got the thing going, so I've done that many times. I, I love that technique. Number three, this is the embarrassing one. Can who here thinks it's a good idea to go shame your colleagues? Uh, you know, maybe once a year, maybe once a month. Anybody like that idea? No. 
how fancy the science is. So I did this once, although they didn't know it. Um, this is a, what's called a control chart, a process control chart. If you're familiar, familiar with uh, Lean Six Sigma efforts, uh, you'll probably recognize these charts. This is one I did in my department. These are some data points from uh, where we were tracking how well we were doing it, doing employee performance reviews. Every year an employee would get a review. Uh, at the time, everybody was getting reviewed on an annual basis based upon their hire date, the anniversary of their hire date. So as you'd imagine, you'll see stuff spread out through the year, sometimes be bunched up, spread out. In the mix of everyday life, those, would, those dates and deadlines would slip by and you wouldn't get them done. And we were really bad at this. In fact, if you see that top line there is 400, that red line, there were two of those data points where we were actually doing two reviews in one time just to get an employee current, which is really embarrassing as a manager to, to do that. Uh, not a big employee satisfaction uh, factor. So I'm thinking, you know, we really sucked at this and wanted to get better. Uh, we have a Lean Six Sigma department, as I mentioned. I took this data to them, and their eyes lit up as soon as I told them I had two plus years of data on this. And I could tell they were knew this was an issue and they were wanting to fix it. So this validated my thought that, yes, we're bad, but I think the entire company sucks at it too. So I offered to present this information at a leadership meeting the following month, and that meeting has uh, all the frontline managers, directors, and executives from Floyd attending. So I don't remember exactly what I said, but I got up in a group like this, I showed this chart, they just said we suck, and uh, got down. Uh, in the back of the room, the HR director came up and said, Charles, that was pretty gutsy. And then later, I had several directors come and they says, we have the same problem. So I'm thinking, yes, I tapped into that. So um, what happened was a new process was created for the entire company. Um, we changed from doing it on an, uh, an anniversary date mode to doing everybody's at the same time of the year. So on July 1st of every year, everybody gets the review done. So that problem was permanently fixed. And I think I had credit to do that. So essence of PMA Keto here is reviews needed to be done on time. I aired my dirty laundry and shamed them to action. I think it was uh, Natalie Williams yesterday was talking about one of the challenges is that people are afraid to air their dirty laundry. Well, this is a case where it's good to go embrace it sometimes and just go let it out there and let everybody see it because it moved people to action in this case. Also struck me that if you saw Bodine's presentation yesterday, talking about structural tension, this feels like to me an example of that where you've got a current, current status, desired result, this tension wants to close itself up. I did nothing after that. It just took it a life of its own. And then six months later, we had a new process that just happened without me doing anything about it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Number four, you're in my critical path. I think every project manager knows what critical path is. It's those set of tasks that are interrelated that um, determine the shortest path from the beginning to the end of a project. And if you have a task on that, on that critical path, uh, if it gets delayed, it delays the project by the same amount of time. So imagine you're, uh, um, I got an employee named Bob. I said, Bob, you're on my critical path. Uh, every day you delay this task, you delay the end of my project. Uh, that would be pretty powerful for somebody to say to me. But I think the way you want to do this in an Aikido method to make it really most effective is you want to say it in a very technical, dispassionate way. Say, Bob, you know, I'm looking at the project plan today. There's a task assigned to you that's uh, on a critical path. Tomorrow it's going to go overdue. So what can you do to help me to make sure that doesn't happen? So again, like the last example, people generally want to help. No one wants to be in that critical path um, being the one that's stopping a project. Now, if people are not cooperating with that, another way to deal with it is, is take the names out of it. But in the status report, we, a lot of them have areas we have uh, management attention, and you could put this item listed in there. Uh, say this particular task is on a critical path, this is going to go overdue tomorrow. I have some executives that read those status reports like a hawk. They zero in on that kind of stuff, and it's like chum in the water with sharks. So uh, I, using this approach, I pretty much enlisted someone else to do my work for me to say, get this work done. So the essence of PM Aikido here is I wanted to get the deliverable done. I just got you focused on it. Again, low eye, low effort, 
high results, all in an easy step. Number five, the last example is let the data speak. Uh, these screenshots here from PDOR from, from uh, some of our data, and look at all that red. Well, that's scary looking. Um, we're still working our way down the path of getting things balanced out. Uh, a lot of that is one big humongous project that's a major one that's finishing up now, so it will, hopefully that red will go away soon. But these are powerful images for people to see. In fact, before we had PDWare, I had an Excel spreadsheet that had all the projects on it. And I would, uh, when I go to a meeting that I think something's going to come up about projects, I would print out this thing on as big a piece of paper as I could. And I'd take it with me in a meeting, and I'd pull it out and just lay it on the table in front of me, and I don't say anything about it. And inevitably, someone was sitting next to me and say, Charles, what's that? What's that? And I said, that's the list of all the IT projects we've got going on. And I said, you know, the one we're talking about right now, it's not on this list. So I don't really know what we're going to do. So it quickly became known that we need to get on Charles's list. Uh, now it's Heather's list. She's one of my counterparts that's running the PMO now. So it's now Heather's list. But this is a very effective tool. Very little effort on my part. Just lay it on the table. It drives a lot of discussion. So it helps. Again, force visibility. People see the list. It forces prioritization. So we're on this list you think you're going to fit. It helps reduce the chaos of unplanned projects. So people typically come to our department, not so much anymore now, but it's a common thing to say, I got a project I want to start tomorrow. I need it done by, you know, a month and a half from now. We kind of, kind of chuckle, like, wow, where have you been? Um, so I hate to say, you know, sorry we can't do that, but um, it's going to be a challenge to fit you in. So people want things done right away. Uh, you don't believe me that, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on. I just showed you the data that makes it hard to disagree with it. So um, it's been a helpful tool to line people up and uh, get data, uh, get projects prioritized. So what are the lessons learned from this and what are the things that you can take away? Uh, I feel like I've earned a lot of these myself and they're deeply buried in my psyche. So here's the takeaways. Go out and hone your provoking strategies. Find what you see among this and uh, that you might use yourself. Make them work for you. You don't have to be a low I like myself for them to be effective. You can be a high D and use them the same techniques as well. You can provoke colleagues, bosses, and vendors with calculated impunity and have associates marvel at your project success. But most importantly, this is confidential. <laughs> Do not tell anybody about this. Because the more people know about it, the less effective it becomes. So it's just between us. Uh, so what I want you to do is to go out and provoke some people when you get back home, but just do it nicely. Don't let them know you're doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you.